Good morning and welcome on this 10th Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost. Our service of Holy Eucharist, Rite 2, begins on page 355 of the Red Book of Common Prayer, or on page 3 of your worship booklet. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings of Holy Scripture. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. Am I a God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long? Will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back, those who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart? They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? The word of the Lord. O Lord, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. 
God takes his stand in the council of heaven. He gives judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show favor to the wicked? Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. Save the weak and the orphan, defend the humble and needy, Rescue the weak and the poor. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. They do not know, neither do they understand. They go about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. Now I say to you, you are gods, and all of you, children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. By when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the, spy, the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fa fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. When received, women received, became mighty in war, but foreign arm, women received their dead by resurrection, Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, 
and let us run with per perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five and one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it's going to rain and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be a scorching heat and it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of the one true living and loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. We live in a paradox. Life as we know it 
is a paradox. Good and evil, war and peace, normal and not normal. And we could even carry it a bit further, rich and poor, the haves and the have-nots, the heretic and the orthodox, straw and wheat, heaven and earth, truth and lies. Our contemporary culture defines paradox as a riddle without an answer, a problem without a solution, or a tension that cannot be relieved. We all live within this tension of the paradox, and it's very difficult. Within the paradox, we must make important decisions that govern our lives, who to follow, how to act, and even what to believe. We long for everything to be spelled out for us, that we wish that someone would just put it in a manual that we can read or put it in a box that we can carry around with us. Even with the knowledge, skills, and abilities that we developed and acquired through technology, we often make many mistakes living in this paradox. But we need to give ourselves credit because sometimes we do make the right choices and sometimes we do get it right. But we know better than that. When we get into a real mess, we wish that we could prophesy and tell the future, thinking that somehow knowing the future would make it all better for us. The word paradox even makes us uncomfortable until we realize that the Bible, the New Testament in particular, is full of paradox. Now, Jesus has been teaching us these past few weeks while he was on his way to Jerusalem. We've learned about how to be a disciple. We've been set out in the muck of our lives to try to live the good news of our salvation. We've been taught to greet others along the way with hospitality and to love them, thereby being Christ to them. We've been called to show a greater commitment to eternal things by sharing them and living in our community and growing in our common life together. And this morning, it seems like all of a sudden Jesus changes gears on us, throws us in a sort of a paradox. We go from Jesus calling for intense following and loyal devotion and urgent mission to Jesus speaking of fire and division and prophecy. These words are scary and hard to hear because it's not Jesus' normal tone that we've been getting used to over the past few weeks. These aren't the comfortable words that Jesus has been giving us in the previous 42 verses of Luke. This isn't the fateful following mission and hospitality that we've been hearing about. Therefore, we have this paradox that Luke presents us with this morning. We need to look for answers in the tension of that paradox between what we've already previously learned about what it means to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior and what we're presented with this morning. Jesus says he came to bring fire to the earth and how he wishes it were already kindled. To us today, these words seem pretty harsh. seems like Jesus is wanting to impose some kind of harsh divine judgment and burn everything to the ground a judgment that we would expect to come at the end of times when we know that the world will be judged. However, when we read this passage with the same urgency of mission that Jesus has been presenting to us all along, and we put some of the language that he uses in its proper context, we can start to understand that Jesus is actually teaching us in the way that he has all along in the way to Jerusalem. In Jesus' time, the the word they used for oven, which was located outdoors, is the same word that they used for earth. So when Jesus says he came to bring fire to the earth, it's an idiom for getting things started. Or as we would probably say today, let's get cooking. So Jesus says he's ready to get things started. And Jesus knows that getting things fired up with any kind of urgency is going to cause some social problems among his followers. Family and social status was all they had. This was the source of their livelihood. And most often it meant for some folks the difference between life and death. 
Back then, you were alienated from your family or clan by associating with what was considered to be the wrong people or the inappropriate social relationships that they made. In this case, Jesus. So by associating with Jesus, you were putting everything at risk. Your wealth, your inheritance, and your social status. You would move very quickly from being a have to being a have-not. The consequence of this kind of involvement would be enough to cause so much tension that it would pit family against family, son against father, and mother against daughter, and yes, even mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and divide the household. We cannot make a commitment to Jesus as the Christ, to Jesus as Lord and Savior, without affecting the way that we relate to each other, to our friends and our family members. Our commitment to Christ shapes our values, our priorities, our goals, and of course our behavior. It causes us to change. Change the old patterns of our lives and it causes us to face new and difficult choices in our commitment to follow the gospel. Our decision to follow Jesus is faced sometimes with opposition from others. As a follower, we opt to live within that tension of the paradox with the choices that we must make. When we set out to follow Jesus and do what we perceive as good, moral, and right, we are doing something countercultural. Jesus himself knew the devastating consequences that it would have by following him as Lord and Savior. So he warned his followers to be prepared to encounter those harsh realities also. As a follower of Christ, we must look at our own lives through the lens of this paradox. What do we pay close attention to? And to what do we turn a blind eye? What claims our closest attention? Fluctuations in the stock market? Evidence of our social standing? Our grade point average? Opportunities to look good in front of our boss or superiors at work? What things do we watch with the same close attention that the Palestinian farmer paid to the changes in the weather? Jesus' sayings this morning challenge us to examine the paradox and the tensions that exist between what gets our attention and what's neglected in our life. We should consider whether these inconsistencies of prioritizing the insignificant things, while jeopardizing those things that could have the greatest value and importance. We could ask the questions of ourselves. Have we given much attention to the health of the church as we have our retirement plans? Or even, have we given as much attention to the maintenance of our spiritual disciplines and our prayer life as we have to our maintenance schedule for our car, perhaps? Where in the scale of our attention to detail does our devotion to the teachings of our Lord rank? Jesus says that we may be able to interpret the weather, but we remain blind to what's really going on in our lives. As we approach the holy table this morning and partake of the bread and wine, which is that bond of communion that we share with one another, When we receive that today, let us focus on our unity and our belief that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And let us be fed with that spiritual food that is only His to give. In our community of faith, we've made that conscious decision to continue the work of our Lord Jesus. We're to do what He commanded to get things cooking and to live through the struggles of discerning our path together. And as we live into the tension of that paradox, let us always remain focused on why we're here and what we're doing, and make the effort to move forward in mission of our Lord together. Amen.
Let us stand together. Turn to page 358 of the Red Book of Common Prayer on page 6 of your worship booklet. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us now pray to God who strengthens the weak. Please stand, sit, or kneel as best helps you to pray. For this holy gathering and for the people of God in every place. Lord, have mercy. For all nations and their leaders, and for mercy, justice, and peace in the world. Lord, have mercy. For students and teachers and all those returning to their studies. Lord, have mercy. For good weather and abundant crops, and for travelers and those on vacation. Lord, have mercy for the sick and suffering, prisoners and their families, the hungry and the oppressed, and all in danger and need. We remember those who have asked for our prayers, especially Ethan Self, Amanda Gretchen Shaw, Myron and Scott, Mike McRae, Irene Lamb, Eleanor Henninger, Bailey, Shay, Sharon, and, and Daria, Eva and Corey, Pat Russo, Frank Ham, Joe R., Carol Mandel, Betty and family, Kate Williams, Fred and Barb Johnson, Ann Oliver Cannon, Bill Ahall, Michael R., Myra and family, Jeff Goldman, Catherine Stooksbury, Bill Richmond, Garth King, Chris and Daniel, Harvey and Mary Ann, Dee Vest, Jenny Yelp, Bill Holland, Garrett, Jeff Kesterson, Jeremy Lamb, Beth, Harrowood family, Kirk Vaught, Janice Rankin, Faulkner and McCarter family, Ethan M. Pam Benko. We also pray for those who are still affected by the pandemic. Lord, have mercy. For those who rest in Christ, who rest in Christ and for all of the dead. Lord, have mercy. For our city and those who live in it, for our families and companions and all those we love. Lord, have mercy. Lifting our voices with all creation, with the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. To you, Lord, God of all times and places, whose word is like fire, grant our prayers for all the world and bring peace to the earth. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Turning to page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Please stand as you're able. My brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. One and all, please be seated for just a couple of announcements. I do call your attention to the announcements just inside the cover of your bulletin, along with the prayer list, so please pay attention to those. Welcome to anyone who may be at St. James for the first time. Please know that you are welcome at this table. You don't necessarily need to be an Episcopalian. If you profess a belief in our Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're welcome to partake of the bread and wine. Um, the instructions are on the back of the bulletin when it says under what to do for communion. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Then let us ascribe to the Lord the honor to His name, bring offerings and come into His courts with praise and thanksgiving.
Our service continues with Eucharistic Prayer A, found on page 361 of the prayer book, or on page 8 of your worship booklet. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you've made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling His death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by Him and with Him and in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Dear friends, these are the gifts of God and we are the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on Him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank You for feeding us with spiritual food, the most precious body and blood of Your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of Your Son and heirs of Your eternal kingdom. Now, Father, send us out to do the work You have given us to do, to love and serve You as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To Him, to You, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. May God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you into truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.